Chapter 1, An Introduction to the Fundamentals of Dynamic Business Law, Part 1, presented by Kelly Herzig. In this first chapter, we're going to cover the law and its purposes, classification of the law, the sources of business law, constitutions, statutes, cases, administrative law, treaties, and executive orders. We will also cover the schools of legal interpretation and legal thought. And we will finish up with global and comparative law. We will begin with the law and its purposes. So what is business law in general? Well, your Kubasek textbook actually has a good definition. Your book defines law as the rules of conduct in any organized society that are enforced by the governing authority of the community. If you type in the definition of law in your browser on the internet, you'll get thousands of hits. I've given you one example from Black's Law Dictionary, which is one of the most current legal dictionaries used today. You can see that the Black's Law definition is much longer, probably because it was written by a lawyer. We're very wordy. What it really comes down to is that the law is a system of principles and rules governing human conduct. They are the rules that we all agree as a society to live by. So what is business law? Business law is obviously a subset of the law in general. Business law pervades every aspect of the business world. Law and the business world are inextricably intertwined. In fact, I often say that the law for businesses is both a carrot and a stick. The stick is obviously that laws regulate how businesses can interact, particularly with consumers and customers, but also with each other. The stick means that the law can prohibit business conduct. But the law can also be the carrot in that if businesses act responsibly and lobby well, they can get legislators to pass laws that are favorable to their business and its expansion. So what is business law? They are the enforceable rules of conduct that govern the actions of buyers and sellers in market exchanges. That's the basic definition that you need to know. Fundamentally, business law consists of enforceable rules for commercial relationships and transactions. Just like we have community rules, the business law is the community rules for the business world. Business law pervades each of the six fundamental areas of business study, management, production and transportation, marketing research and development, accounting and finance, and human resource management. So what is the purpose of law? Some of the purposes of law are noted in Exhibit 1.1 on page 4 of your Kubasek textbook. But the most important purpose of the law is that it serves as a moral guide for society. It lays out the minimum expectations of behavior of a society's citizens, both individuals and organizations. The United States is a nation of laws, and no one is above the law. The law helps society maintain order and enables citizens to peacefully resolve disputes. Finally, the law protects citizens' rights and liberties from unreasonable intrusions, violations, or suppressions by the government. Next, we will discuss classification of the law. Law can be classified in many ways. The first is international versus domestic or national law. For example, if a company is located in the United States and is producing goods in the U.S. and selling to U.S. customers located in U.S. states or territories, then the company would be subject to U.S. domestic or national law. However, if that company ships some of its goods to Japan and sells those goods in Japan to Japanese nationals, then those activities would be subject to Japanese law which is international or extraterritorial law. The next major category is federal versus state and local law. 
the United States has a federal system of government and that we have both a national federal system as well as a state system of government and the accompanying laws. This just means that both the federal and the state governments are sovereign and can both pass laws. Local law is usually county and city law. Cities and counties are not considered sovereigns like the state and federal governments are, but they can still pass laws and ordinances. Businesses, depending on how and where they operate, can be subject to local, state, and federal laws, sometimes all at the same time. It's the rare business these days that is solely subject to a particular state and local law, but not federal law, particularly given interstate commerce, that's commerce between the states, and online commercial activities. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose a construction company is located here in Wichita, Kansas. Due to its location, the company would be subject to local Wichita ordinances and laws, as well as Kansas state laws. Now, if the company does business in interstate commerce in any way, such as building a building in Missouri, the company would also be subject to federal law as well. The next classification is public versus private law. Private law involves disputes between private individuals or groups, such as two businesses involved in a legal dispute. For example, a private law dispute would involve a breach of contract action or lawsuit between two corporations. Another example of private law would be a lawsuit between two property owners over the boundary line between their respective properties. Now, public law involves legal disputes between private individuals or groups and the government. An example of a public law dispute would be a lawsuit by the EPA against a business that is illegally dumping chemicals into a river. Another example of public law would be a lawsuit brought by an energy company to challenge an EPA regulation that the company believes is too restrictive and violates a federal statute. The next broad classification is civil versus criminal law. And generally, if something isn't criminal, it's going to be civil. They're big buckets. Civil law involves the rights and responsibilities between private citizens or between private citizens and their government. As I said, civil law is very broad and covers the widest range of disputes not involving those that are criminalized under the law. If it's not in criminal court, it's going to be in civil court in some fashion. Public and private law, which I just talked about, are both a subset of civil law. Now, a contract dispute between two companies would be classified as both private and civil law. An example that would be classified as both public law and civil law would be a dispute by ranchers over water rights leases on federal land with the federal government. Criminal law involves an act by someone against the public in violation of established codified law. Violations of the law can be prosecuted by the federal government, the state, or even local governments. While crime is often committed by individuals, business entities can also be legally prosecuted if they break the law. Criminal laws are perhaps the easiest for the general public to understand. Most people comprehend and accept laws prohibiting acts of murder, thievery, physical harm, or financial malfeasance. A good example of criminal law involving businesses is that the Department of Justice can criminally prosecute companies that are cheating investors or committing insider trading or fraud. In addition, for example, the EPA can bring criminal charges against companies that pollute rivers. Next, let's talk about the sources of business law. Business people most often ask, well, what laws govern my company and how do I find these laws so that I can comply with them? So let's ask the question, how is the law created and where do we find the law? The first place to look is constitutions, both the U.S. Constitution and any state constitution. Pretty much every state has some form of constitution. We can also look in statutes passed by legislatures at the federal, state, and even local level. 
Then there's case law, which are written legal interpretations of the law issued by judges. There is a wide range of published opinions at both the state and federal level. You can also find the law in regulations, administrative law, and these are issued by federal, state, and local agencies. Laws can also be found in treaties. Most often business people will be worried about international treaties, particularly on trade, but there can be treaties between states, although they are very rare. You can also find the law in executive orders. These are directive, directives issued by the president or state governors. We will begin our discussion of the sources of business law with the most important source, the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is the highest source of law in our country. It is the supreme law of the land and establishes the fundamental rights, rules, and principles under which our country is governed. Constitutional law concerns the general limits and powers of the government as interpreted from its written constitution. The U.S. Constitution is widely considered a masterpiece and one of the most influential legal documents in existence today. The framers of the Constitution intended that the Constitution would be a living document for future generations. The framers of the Constitution did not want to create a static document that would have to be continually amended to be effective. Rather, they wanted to create a document that could grow and change as society grew and changed. The framers knew that the laws changed and developed and wanted the Constitution, which would form the basis of our country's laws, to be able to adapt to those changes and developments over time. The Constitution is now one of the oldest and shortest constitutions in existence. It has only four pages and 4,543 words. Our Constitution, while being an important legal document in our country, has also inspired over 200 countries in writing democratic constitutions on their own. If you ever get to Washington, D.C., go to the National Archives. It's worth the trip. That's where the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence are all displayed. Let's briefly talk about how the Constitution was created. The U.S. Constitution was drafted at the Constitutional Convention held in Philadelphia from May 25, 1787 to September 17, 1787. Officially, the convention was called to revise the rather weak Articles of Confederation, which had governed the state since the end of the Revolutionary War. By 1787, the union between the states was unraveling, with growing conflicts among the states. To save our young nation, a convention was called and delegates met at the Pennsylvania State House, now known as Independence Hall. Alexander Hamilton was a key figure in getting the convention together. There were 55 delegates from 12 states who elected George Washington as the president of the convention. Rhode Island did not send any delegates. There were about 70 delegates called up, but only the 55 attended. Jonathan Dayton from New Jersey was the youngest, he was 26, and Benjamin Franklin was the oldest. He was 81 and so infirm, he had to be carried into the State House most days. Thomas Jefferson did not attend because he was the ambassador to France. Neither did John Adams, he was the ambassador to Great Britain. So neither attended the convention or signed the Constitution. George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison, who is known not only as the fourth president of the United States, but also as the father of the U.S. Constitution, all wanted to create a new form of government. And by mid-June, that was the focus. Madison drafted the Virginia Plan, which at its core detailed three co-equal branches of government, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, with checks and balances of power. It is the Virginia plan that forms the basis of our current Constitution. You see, under the Articles of Confederation, states acted together only for specific purposes, and the Confederation Congress had no enforcement powers, couldn't regulate commerce, print money, or even pay their military. 
the Constitution united all U.S. citizens as members of one nation, vesting the power of the Union with the people. It created a strong federal government that had the power to act for and fund its activities on behalf of the whole nation. It was not an easy road to get there. And there were many compromises, as many of the delegates were wary of a strong federal government, having just thrown off monarchy rule. Ultimately, 31 delegates signed the document. Now, this isn't a history class, so I do not expect you to know the nature of the major compromises between the small and largely populated states, between the more industrial northern states and the more agrarian south, and between the slave and non-slave states. Think about what it must have been like in the State House that summer. If you've ever visited Independence Hall, you might have been surprised by the size of the room. It's not that big. On average, 30 to 40 delegates at any given time were in attendance. They wore a lot more clothes than men do now, and some wore wigs. Of course, there was no air conditioning, and the windows were shuttered. From Madison's notes on the convention, both the temperature and tempers were hot during debates on the proposed provisions. While there were some industrialists among the delegates, on average, they were middle-aged white farmers. There was no diversity among them. Moreover, most were wealthy or at least very prosperous. Yet they managed to create one of the greatest and most enduring democratic legal documents in the world. Not bad for a group of middle-aged white privileged farmers. The Constitution was submitted to the states for ratification on September 17, 1787, and then became effective June 21, 1788, when the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified it. So let's talk about what's actually in the U.S. Constitution. As I said before, the U.S. Constitution only has four pages, and it only has seven actual articles within it. Article 1 creates the legislature, the House of Representatives, and the U.S. Senate. The House of Representatives is a membership from each state based on state population. So the census that's taken is very important because it helps establish state population and thus the right to representation in the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is elected every two years. And to serve there, you must be at least 25 years old and been a U.S. citizen for at least seven years. The Senate, on the other hand, is not concerned with population. The Senate has two members from every state, regardless of state population. The Senate is elected every six years, and you have to be at least 30 years old and been a U.S. citizen for nine years to serve in the Senate. Article 2 creates the executive, the president, and the vice president. The president is elected every four years by the Electoral College, not by popular vote. You must be at least 35 years old and a natural born U.S. citizen to serve as the U.S. president. That's why Arnold Schwarzenegger, although he is the has been the governor of California, has never been able to run for president because he is not a natural born U.S. citizen. Article 3 creates the federal judiciary. Article 3 judges are appointed for life terms, and they are appointed by the president with advice and consent of the Senate. Now let's talk about the other articles. Article 4 details states' rights. Um, Article 5 deals with how to amend the Constitution. It requires two-thirds of the states ratifying any amendment. Article 6 is about U.S. debts, the federal supremacy, and the oaths of office. And Article 7 details ratification of the Constitution, which we talked about. It required two-thirds of the states to ratify the Constitution. That's it. It's not very long. The next major source of business law is the Bill of Rights. One of the many points of contention between the Federalists, who advocated for a strong national government, and the state's rights supporters was the Constitution's lack of a Bill of Rights that would place specific limits on government power. The Federalists argued that the Constitution did not need a Bill of Rights because the people and the states kept any powers not given to the federal government under Article 4. 
However, the state's rights supporters felt a Bill of Rights was necessary to safeguard individual liberty. If the framers had not agreed to add a Bill of Rights, the Constitution might never have been ratified. So what's in the Bill of Rights? The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. It was designed to assuage concern that the constitutional text did not protect basic human liberties. This was the position of the state's rights supporters. The 10 amendments list specific prohibitions on governmental power and were drafted in response to calls from several states for greater constitutional protection for individual liberties. The Bill of Rights, proposed and authored by James Madison, was sent to the states for ratification in September 1789. It was actually 12 amendments, but only 3 through 12 were ratified by the states in 1791. The proposed second amendment was actually ratified as the 27th Amendment in 1992. Yes, it hung out there for that long, and it took over 200 years to get it ratified before two-thirds of the states actually passed it. There are in total 27 amendments to the Constitution currently, including the Bill of Rights. What specifically is in the Bill of Rights? As I mentioned, it's the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, and they protect individual rights and individual liberties. There's Article 1, the First Amendment, which I think is one of the most important amendments there is. It's freedom of expression and religion. This protects freedom of religion, which protects your right to worship as you see fit. It prevents the government from creating a state religion and protects a free press, free speech, and the right to peacefully assemble to protest the government. People who live in authoritarian regimes or dictatorships generally don't have these rights. They don't have the right to free speech. They don't have a free press and they don't have the right to protest against their government, and they take their lives into their own hands if they try to do so. I think as Americans, we take the First Amendment rights we have for granted, and we forget that there are so many people around the world who don't have those rights, and we shouldn't take them for granted. Then there's Article 2, the Second Amendment. This is the right to bear arms. This protects the rights of the people to keep and bear arms. The constitutional text actually says militia, but the Second Amendment has been widely interpreted by the Supreme Court to include the individual's right to keep a firearm. Then there's Article 3. You don't see this very much. But the Third Amendment prevents governments from forcing homeowners to allow soldiers to use their homes. Before the Revolutionary War, laws gave British soldiers the right to take over private homes without compensation. They actually forced people out of their homes and onto the street. Then there's Article 4, the Fourth Amendment. This is search and seizure. It protects against unreasonable searches and seizures of property, and it requires warrants based on probable cause to search persons and property. Then there's Article 5, the Fifth Amendment. This is the rights of persons in criminal trials. These are the rights of the accused. They have a right to a grand jury. They have a right against self-incrimination. They have a right to protections from double jeopardy, meaning they can't be tried twice for the same offense. They have the right to due process of law and the protection of property. They can't be deprived of property without just compensation. If you watch crime dramas and a witness is on the stand and they say, I take the fifth, what they're doing is they're invoking their right against self-incrimination, their right to remain silent so as not to incriminate themselves. Then there's Article 6, the Sixth Amendment, deals with more rights of the accused in criminal prosecutions. They have a right to a speedy trial, the right to present and confront witnesses against them, they have a right to counsel to represent them, and they have a right to a jury trial, a right to a jury of their peers. Article 7, the Seventh Amendment, deals with civil trials, and this provides a right to jury trials in federal civil cases. Then there's Article 8, the Eighth Amendment. These are further guarantees in criminal cases, that there is no excessive bail or fine, and it protects against cruel and unusual punishment. Groups that want to challenge the death penalty, for example, will cite the Eighth Amendment's prohibitions against cruel and unusual punishment to justify the abolition of the death penalty. 
Then there's Article 9, the Ninth Amendment. This deals with unenumerated rights. It states that listing specific rights in the Constitution does not mean that people do not have other rights that have not been spelled out. This is implied rights. Uh, the right of privacy is often said to come in part from the Ninth Amendment. Then there's Article 10, the Tenth Amendment, which is reserved powers. And it says that rights not granted the federal government are reserved to the states and the people. This mimics language in the Constitution's Article 4. This is the end of Chapter 1, Part 1.